My epiphany began a dozen years ago when, on my retirement and return to Connecticut, I subscribed to a nearby city's daily papers. I soon found it filled with reports of federal grants in support of an astonishing variety of purely local purposes. These included, for example, a one and a half million dollar grant of highway trust funds for the rehabilitation of a vandalized railroad station that had long since been converted to private non-transportation uses. Nearly two million dollars to replace a one lane bridge connecting two small communities a dozen miles from my home, financing for an art center honoring Catherine Hepburn, and a half million dollars a grant to widen two streets leading to a school. That last is my favorite example of congressional imagination. Those sidewalks are being widened courtesy of an act of Congress titled the Federal Safe Routes to School Program. Its explicit purpose is to fight juvenile obesity by encouraging children to bike or walk to school. I'm not aware that the parents of the children attending that school feel that that is the most cost-effective way to slim their children, but no matter, you don't turn down Santa Claus even if the money he distributes comes from the federal taxes you pay or from the debt that those children will have to repay. Congress finds its authority to create such programs in a 1937 Supreme Court construction of the Constitution's spending clause, which empowers it to spend money, quote, to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. The mischief lies in the words general welfare. The Supreme Court recently summarized that holding as enabling Congress in pursuit of its understanding of the general welfare to use federal funds to, quote, induce the states to adopt policies that the federal government itself could not impose. Thus, Congress is now licensed to concern itself with areas in which it is forbidden to act by offering to subsidize a whole spectrum of state activities on the condition that the states accept Congress's directions on how they are to discharge their own responsibilities. Because those programs deal with matters beyond Congress's constitutional authority, the court has made it plain that participation in them may not be coerced. As I know from my own experience as a senator, those in elective office are always in search of ways to maintain closer contact with their constituents and of new ways uh, to please them. The Supreme Court's 1937 decision opened up a vast new horizon for doing precisely that. It was not until the Lyndon Johnson administration began invading areas that had formerly been considered off limits to the federal government, however, that uh, uh, members of Congress came to realize the political opportunities that this new court precedent had opened up for them. Thus, while at the outset of that administration, there were just 132 such programs, today there are more than 1,100 of them. In 1970, when I was elected to the Senate, those programs distributed $24 billion. This coming year, they will distribute almost $641 billion, which will amount to one-sixth of total federal spending and all for purposes that are the exclusive business of the states. A surprising aspect of this development is how few people, including those here on Capitol Hill, are aware that those figures do not begin to reflect the full cost of those programs or of the vast changes they have brought about in the way we now govern ourselves. Because those grants come with the most detailed instructions, their total out-of-pocket cost to the federal fisc includes not just the amounts distributed, but the expenses incurred in drafting regulations, screening grants applications, and ensuring, ensuring that recipients comply with the federal rulebook. 
The cost of that additional work has been estimated at one dollar for every 10 distributed <coughs> for a total of about $64 billion in the coming year. The major cost of the federal government, however, may well be the diversion of congressional attention from the critical issues that only Congress can address. <clears throat> Studies confirm that its members spend heroic amounts of time on their work. Those studies also confirm that they spend a major portion of their time attending to constituent concerns that, unfortunately, tend to focus on matters that are the responsibilities of governors and city councils rather than those of a congressman. Matters such as public housing, job training, education, homelessness, and unfilled potholes. That last uh, comes to mind because a recent senator's attention to urban minutia actually earned him the nickname of Senator Pothole. <laughs> but those are precisely the kinds of matters to which those 1,100 grants and aid programs are addressed. The costs at the state level are so diverse that it is impossible in this presentation to describe them all or to give an adequate idea of their cumulative impact. But here are some of the kinds to which I refer. To ensure compliance with the detailed regulations governing their use, federal grants and uh, add layers of state and local administrative expenses to the costs of the subsidized projects. They also impose one-size-fits-all requirements on states as different as Arizona, Alaska, and New York, thus preventing their officials from applying common sense and local knowledge in securing the best, best value for the money expended. Furthermore, they can trigger a host of unfunded mandates. I believe there are more, more than a thousand of them today. So, mandates such as the Bacon Davis Act's requirement that the equivalent of union wages be paid for construction work involving the expenditure of any federal dollars, which can add as much as 20% to the cost of work. They distort state priorities by offering lucrative grants for purposes of often trivial importance. They encourage the waste that comes from, with spending someone else's money, what economists refer to as cost externalization, and they undermine accountability because state officials bound by federal regulations cannot be held responsible for the costs and failures of the projects they manage. And because those regulations are made by distant bureaucrats, Frustrated citizens who are directly affected by those programs have lost their ability to decide how their tax dollars are to be used. To compound the injury, I have found no evidence that the intervention of the federal government in the delivery of state and local services has improved their quality, but there is ample evidence of its failure to do, uh, to do so. The site, uh, to cite just one example, the feds first became involved in education in a significant way almost 50 years ago with the enactment of the Elementary and Secondary Act of 1965. Yet as Andrew Colson has demonstrated in his exhaustive 2014 study, State Education Trends, during the succeeding decades, there has been no improvement in the quality of education nationally, despite a tripling of inflation-adjusted dollars spent per child. On the other hand, about the only encouraging developments in the field of education, such as vouchers and charter schools, are the results of state and community initiatives. This litany of costs notwithstanding, Advocates of federal grants argue that they are warranted for two reasons. The first is that the federal government is able to attract the greater, expert, a greater expertise than the states. Uh, that is no doubt true, but it begs the question as to whether academic prowess uh, <clears throat> trumps the hands-on experience and personal accountability on which the states once relied. 
Compare the Centers for Disease Control's bungling of the Ebola crisis with New Jersey's simple policy of quarantining those exposed to the disease. The advocate's second argument is that federal grants redistribute money from the wealthier states to the poorer ones, thus enabling the latter to maintain appropriate standards in such key areas as education. That is a seductive argument because the per capita income of the 10 poorest states is only about 68% of that of the 10 richest. Variations in state cost of living, however, can muddy the analytical waters. To cite one extreme example, Mississippi's per capita income is 75% of Hawaii's, but its cost of living is only 55% of the latter's. I doubt, though, that anyone would suggest that Mississippians who inhabit our poorest state should send care packages to Hawaii, which is our 17th wealthiest. Redistribution, redistribution is thus a weaker argument than it appears. But if redistribution is indeed a proper uh, function of the federal government, and I don't know if it is, there is a far better way to achieve that goal without imposing webs of re federal regulations on all the states, rich and poor alike. The federal government could simply provide the have-not states with block grants having the sole requirement that the recipients use the money for welfare or education or some other specific purpose. Under that approach, Washington would not be telling the states how to meet their own responsibilities.